Welcome to today's presentation. Hope everybody is doing well and that you can hear me okay. If you wouldn't mind just posting something in the chat so I know that you can all hear me, that would be amazing. So. I see someone raise their hand, but I am not able to take questions right now. But if you could just post in the comments in the chat, if you can hear me and see me, just so I make sure, you know, I know that I'm starting out. OK, that would be great if you could do that. Oh, the chat is disabled. OK, so um, but you can hear me. OK, thank you for confirming that, Yvonne. Um, I think we'll leave the chat disabled then and we'll just take questions through this Q&A. Um, as we go through, if you have a question that comes up, you can type it in here and I will get to it hopefully later on in the presentation um, or if it's, you know, or if it's at the end. So either one of those, but feel free to ask your questions through the Q&A and we will get started. So welcome to today's webinar. Um, if you're watching live, thanks for joining. And for those of you that are watching the recording later, thank you all for taking the time to tune in. Um, here, we're going to discuss International Entrepreneur Pro, IEP, um, also known as IER, which is the International Entrepreneur Rule. Um, so hopefully you're all in the right place. Um, and let's get started. So a little bit about, oh, just Standard disclaimer is that this is obviously for informational purposes. It's not specific legal advice for you. Um, you obviously should contact an attorney and um, contact us if you want advice from us. But, you know, this is just general information. Processing times, any information is subject to change. So just keep that in mind. Um, so here's just a little bit about me. I've been practicing immigration exclusively for over 15 years. I have done a lot of work in relation to startup immigration. Um, I've submitted testimony for congressional hearings. I've written a book on startup immigration. And so this is a big part of my work. And it's also a big passion of mine as well. So I'm really happy that I can be here today. Um, and why is this so important? Well, you know, having options for startups is critical to the US um, as a whole, I think. And our immigration laws that we have right now that have been passed by Congress are extremely outdated. So we're talking like 30 years old. And it's important because a lot of our international peers have modernized their immigration system. And we're kind of stuck a little bit in, in you know, in the 30 year plus time warp. However, the International Entrepreneur Pro program is a new option. And we'll get into what, what the requirements are and stuff, but it's not a law that was passed by Congress. Um, so we're still waiting for Congress to pass it. This was passed by executive order through the prior former President Obama. So anyway, immigrants are, are make up a portion of our a large portion of the workforce, 17%, but they have really, you know, always gone above and beyond in terms of company creation, in terms of startup creation, and in terms of impact. They punch way above, well above their weight. Our weight, I can say that, because I am a proud immigrant myself from Ireland. Um, but look, all the stats just show this is a good thing. We need immigration options for startups, and we need to be encouraging um, startups from, from coming, you know, encouraging them to come into the U.S. Um, so yeah, we can review all these stats and we can see exactly why this is a good thing and why we just need more of this type of, um, these type of options from the administration, but obviously from Congress too. So today we're here to talk about a very specific option known as International Entrepreneur Pro. Um, this is an option that is created for startups, but not exclusively. Um, and just founders of companies in general. Um, it is an Obama era regulation that allows foreign born entrepreneurs to come to or remain in the US and work on their startup or their company. Um, so I mentioned this at the start, it's not a law that was passed by Congress. So it's not a visa. It is actually a regulation that was passed by the Obama administration originally, and it uses the existing parole authority that is in the law. So there is um, a part of the law that allows um, the Department Secretary of State, um, basically that allows the government to parole in people um, under certain circumstances. Um, these regulations say startup entrepreneurs should be 
part of this group that um, can be paroled into the U.S. because of the benefit they bring to the U.S. So that's kind of the, the basis of this. It is not a visa. So sometimes you'll hear, you know, discussed as like a startup visa or, or you know, international entrepreneur visa. It's not a visa. And that's because it's not a law that was passed by Congress. Um, it is not a path to permanent residency. It is, but it maybe could be used to springboard to other options that may result in more permanent options. Um, it is also not exclusive to startup founders per se. And I don't really know that that's ever defined anyway, but, you know, in theory, if, if people are meeting the requirements, if the companies are meeting the requirements, it should be um, able to be used by, by companies across the board. Although you'll probably find that a more traditional startup type company would, would you know, meet the requirements over, um, you know, let's say a, another type of business. So it, this option was really created for companies that have potential for significant growth and job creation in the US. So that's the kind of over, overarching umbrella of this option. We must show that the companies have potential for significant growth and job creation here in the US. And um, there's, a, there's ways that we can do this. But if an immigrant entrepreneur, so the founder, co-founders may be eligible to use this option if they have a major ownership share in the company, so it's defined as 10% plus initially. Um, and the company created in the US in the past five years or receipt of funding in the past five years. So kind of a newer, newly created company. And um, they must also have a central and active role in the startup. And we've consulted with people who have made an investment and had an ownership share, but really were more like a silent partner and they weren't actively participating in the company. Um, you know, it's for people who are actively participating in the running of the company. Um, and we must show, again, that the, the company is going to have a positive benefit on the U.S. And there's a few different ways that we can kind of show that. But really, this is for companies that have received funding in the U.S. It is for over, like, let's say, qualified investors. There's a threshold of 264,000 Um or awards or grants from, from government entities, or potentially a mixture of both of these. But some type of US-based funding the company must have received from either you know qualified investors that will get into what the, who they are or a government agency. I think most people that are qualifying are probably coming under this qualified investor 264 threshold or at least a portion of that. So obviously we need to show that you have received the investment, right? That either those, either that 264, 105, like the evidence of the investment and what does that look like? Wire transfers, term sheets, you know, purchase agreements, and um, safes, you know, those types of things that you would have when you're getting obviously money from somebody that's investing in your company and you would have this type of evidence. So we need to be able to document the evidence, which this, or the investment, that is not an overly burdensome request. Um, but it's important to remember that it's not any investment, you know, not any investment is going to qualify for this. They have to, it has to be from qualified investors or the government grants. So qualified investors, these are U.S. investors that have an established record or of successful investments in the U.S. OK, so there's a few different things to unpack. Right. So U.S. investors, established record, successful investments. So the regulations are defining a qualified investor as a U.S. citizen or a green card holder or a U.S. based organization that is majority owned and controlled by U.S. citizens or green card holders. Now, this is important to note because it came up in um, discussions with the USCIS as we were kind of figuring out how the regulations are going to be um, you know, put into practice, practicalities of these. Um, one of these questions came up and the agency provided us with guidance and they said that um, in a venture capital fund, you know, there's money that's been invested from people, you know, limited partners in the US, outside the US from, you know, could be international. And so one of the questions was, it does it, it doesn't matter if the limited partners, so who are providing, let's say, the capital into the fund, doesn't matter if they are overseas or they're not US. And the, they confirmed, the agency said that, if 
the LPs, the limited partners are investing in a venture capital fund. They can be international if the general partners of the fund, so those operating the fund, are U.S. citizens or green card holders in the U.S. So that's an important distinction to make. If you got funding from an overseas VC that was like the whole fund and everything is organized overseas, it's not going to meet the definition of arguably of like U.S. investor. Um, so for this, we're thinking, you know, venture capitalists, angel investors, accelerators, you know, we're not talking about investments from yourself or your immediate family or companies that you own. It's these types of like, let's say, sophisticated investors. Um, and we need to document that this, these investors are, you know, are typical investors or that they're, you know, that they have a record, right? Remember, record of successful investments. Um, and so these are the things that we need to prove from the investor. And obviously, if you're working with a big, massive, you know, VC fund, this is not going to be that onerous to prove, right? They make investments all the time. Um, but it is a, it is documentation that is required from the investor. So we must prove that the investor has invested um, 633k in startups. So the reason the numbers are a bit odd is that they were adjusted up for, for, for inflation from when the, the, um, the regulations were initially written. So the numbers are just not round numbers and that's why. Um, but we need to show that the investor has invested like, you know, over 600,000 in startups. And um, how do we prove that they were successful investments? Well, at least two of these startups must have created five qualifying jobs for US workers or generated, you know, over half a million in annual revenue with a 20% growth rate, okay? Um, so again, we're judging the investor's ability to make good investments. And we're saying, you know, that if this investor has a record of successful investments, well, then chances are they're good at, at you know, betting on startups that do well, therefore proving the potential for growth, right? And um, so the jobs have to be those five jobs, you know, need to be for, you know, in the US, you know, not for lawfully employed workers, not the entrepreneur or their immediate family. Um, so, you know, I think this kind of sh goes to show you the type of investor that you would be looking for if you're trying to qualify based on this 264K from qualified investors. This is the question that has come up to me quite a lot. People who are fundraising when they're kind of, you know, like, talking with VCs if they want to qualify for international entrepreneur parole, keep this in mind. And I really hope this is helpful because I know if I was a startup founder and I was going into a round and looking at raising or, you know, in the early stages, um, this would be helpful for me to know what investments are going to help me on my immigration journey. Um, if this is the option that we have determined is, is probably your, your best bet focusing in on these investors. Um, now, if the investor doesn't meet the qualified investor definition, we may still be able to use, you know, some of the investment and we can talk about that. But ideally, you, but you should have some investment from qualified investors. Maybe if you don't have the full 264, but you have less than that and then you have some other investment, we may be able to kind of make a totality of the circumstances argument. Um. And then again, there's the other, there's the way to qualify based on the government grants um, or awards, but that's less common. Um, so we've discussed the investment that, that the company is receiving. And again, the overarching umbrella reason that you're getting this parole is that your company has a potential for rapid growth and job creation. So you want to be able to document that as well. You want to show in the application, in your international entrepreneur parole application, that your company has this potential. So let's kind of think about how, how you might do that. Um, so, okay, sorry, before I do that, somebody's asking a question about would getting into an accelerator like Techstars or Y Combinator that invest in your venture allow me to get IEP? Um, so yeah, accelerators who make an investment into your startup are generally like meeting that definition of qualified investor because those accelerators have invested the threshold. They've invested in companies that have, you know, done well. So I think, and I believe that that was also discussed as like the VCs, angels um, and accelerators are the types of things, people that you think about, the types of groups and entities that you think about when you're thinking about qualified investor. 
Um, so hopefully that answered your, your question. Um, and please feel free to pop those questions in. And if I can answer them um, like that, that was a very timely question based on the questions that I, or the section that I had just gone over. So please pop them in the chat and I'll do my best to get to them as they come up. Um, okay, so moving back to this like potential, right? So things that you would show that I would doc use and work with our clients to show that they have this potential would be, let's look at how many users you have. Um, have you generated any revenue? Um, you don't have to have generated revenue and you don't have to have any of these. But if you have some of them, they would likely be helpful to show this potential. Um, I mentioned additional fund raising could be relevant, even if it doesn't come from qualified investors. And this is where we would use that additional funding. So what if you've like done crowdfunding that again, it's coming from people that are not qualified investors, but I think it's relevant to the potential of the, um, the company. It would show that there's people interested in the company, that all these people believe that you're solving a problem, that you're doing something that is, you know, worthy of their personal investment. And I think I would use that in, in this way. Um, I also think if there is like a national impact, a social impact, if there's like some, you know, if there's some type of, you know, positive impact that we can show, which I'm sure we can for, you know, for lots of different companies, I think highlighting that makes the case compelling as well. Um, also, let's talk about the founder, like the prior successes of the founder. You know, if you've been successful in the past, doesn't that go to show that you you have the potential to do so again in the, in the future? Um, but again, it's not a prerequisite. This could be done for somebody in their first startup, um, you know, straight from college or in college, in university. Um, it, you don't have to have any of these. These are just like if you have them, we may think we may think about using them. Um, again, positive impact on region or community, kind of like the social impact, the national impact. Um, other things we might use. What about letters from government agencies, investors, people who are business acquaintances? They can talk about your product, your service, things that you're going to be doing and how this would really be have this potential for rapid growth and job creation. Um, if you've received any press, that would be great too. Evidence that you have, this is somebody asked the question about the accelerators. I would also use um, evidence of being accepted into one of those prestigious and highly competitive programs as a way to prove that you have potential to grow this company and create jobs. Again, that's the overarching thing that we're trying to prove. And we're kind of looking at ways to do that. That's one of the ways to do that. And I think that's really solid evidence because you can show how many people apply for tech stars, you know, in each cohort, in each city um, is a highly competitive process. And, you know, the idea is that we're establishing these investors or accelerators as experts in the field. And if experts in the field are betting on you and your startup as as like if this is, has potential, when shouldn't the federal government give you that opportunity? It's kind of the rationale here. Um, and this is why, you know, the investment from qualified investors is important and, and you know, acceptance into prestigious accelerators is also important. Um, other things like if you've received patents, if you have um, had, you know, if you've significant education that's relevant, um, those types of things. Again, you don't have to have this, but if you do, it would be helpful. Um, what if like you've already have your company up and running and you you may be on OPT if you're an international student on your work permit. And um, so the startup is up and running. If you've already hired people, that is great evidence that you have potential to hire more people or maybe even, you know, you, you know, that's like I couldn't think of better evidence to show potential for growth and job creation if you've already hired people. Um, we would show documentation of those hires, their W-2s, which is the end of your tax form, payroll records. Um, and, you know, these types of things that are all together, totality, you know, in total, we're proving that you have this potential for rapid, rapid growth, your company does. Um, again, we must show that you're going to have a central and active role. So you, you know, just having a, an investment or just having like share and ownership in a company, um, is not going to be sufficient. We want to show that you're going to be actively participating in the company. So how do we show that? Well, your resume, your CV, your degrees, um, cap table to show you that you actually do have this ownership, um, employment agreement with the company, and um, press that you've been named on patents, like job description, those types of things to show your 
the CEO, you're the CTO, you're, you know, a co-founder that is going to be actively participating. Show what you've done to date to get the startup to where it is. Because if you're applying for this, you know, you've raised some, some money. So you've obviously been playing an active role. And so we describe what role you've played and, and those types of things would be helpful to show that. Um, so let me just check to see if we have any questions. Um, okay, I think I've answered all the questions that we have so far. Please feel free to pop them in. Um, I just want to take a minute to talk about the procedure for this. I think it's important because um, it's not a visa. So people really probably don't have experience with parole. It's not an option that, you know, you know, people use all the time. Um, and so because of that, there are some questions that come up in, in terms of like, what's the difference between parole and a visa? Or like, how does this work in practice? So it's a two part process. And actually, some visas work in a similar way, being a petition based and then an embassy kind of part. But um, the first thing is we have to file the IER application, International Entrepreneur Rule, IEP application with the USCIS. That's the agency in the US that's the division of the Department of Homeland Security. So we filed the application with the USCIS showing them how you meet all the requirements for parole. And the USCIS will review that application and um, I'll get into processing times at the end. So they will review that application and if they, they will either then approve it or they will issue a request for evidence that needs to be responded to. We're hoping we're going to see less of those because I have heard reports of a lot of those. But as the agency is reviewing and adjudicating these cases, we're hoping that they will get a better handle on how to review them and will stop issuing requests for evidence that are just like unnecessary. Um, so if the case is approved either outright or after a request for evidence, there will be an approval notice. And then the person needs to be paroled into the U.S., because parole only happens at the port of entry. So if you're here, you can potentially apply for an advanced parole document where you can leave the US and come back in using the approval notice and that parole. And um, if you're outside the US, um, or if it's just easier to go to an embassy, um, they, they have discussed getting a travel document, so a boarding foil, um, and you would use that to come in to the US. And again, on entry to the US, you're paroled in. Um, it is, it, it's supposed to be a two and a half year initial parole. And that can be extended if certain conditions are met, like kind of assessing the success of the company, how many jobs have been created, those types of things are assessed um, later. If you're from Canada, if you're Canadian, if you're coming directly from Canada, um, you can just use the approval notice. You don't need an additional thing. Um, and that is consistent with what we see with Canadians. They're visa exempt, visa stamp exempt for a lot of options. So it makes sense that, that there would be a kind of truncated procedure for Canadians. Um, so that is the procedure. It's a filing in the US application with the agency. If that's approved, there is an entry. There is, there is some type of document needs to be received either through parole like process and application that's filed with the original application, or you're going to the embassy for, for like a boarding type of foil in your in your passport. Um advocacy. It's important that I bring this up because you know there's a lot of history with this option and you know, I could probably talk on the history of international entrepreneur parole for a long time, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say that it was originally created under the Obama administration. It was supposed to go into effect about six months into the Trump administration's uh, presidency. Um, however, almost immediately, the Trump administration said they were blocking it and they were not going to be um, using this option. And there was a lot of litigation. The National Venture Capital Association brought a lawsuit that was ultimately successful. And the judge basically said that you can't just cancel a program that's been, you know, created by regulation. There, there are procedures that you need to take in order to, like, rescind a program like this. And then the Trump administration said, OK, well, we're going to we're going to rescind it in, in the way that, you know, we're going to do take the actions that we need to to cancel the program. 
So because of that, that had like such a chilling effect that myself and a lot of my colleagues, nobody was filing these cases because we were told instantly we're going to that the Trump administration was going to be canceling it. And so I had her, I had worked with a client who had filed one. Um, and then there was just massive, massive delays, delays. So I think I only heard of one case getting approved during the whole time within the Trump administration. And they said they were going to cancel it. Then the Biden administration came in and said, we're bringing this back. And we were very excited. They were bringing it back. Um, unfortunately, the execution of like bringing the program back didn't really happen the way we were expecting. The processing times were extremely extremely slow and there was no information on processing times to the point that we were reluctant to recommend this as an option for people um, and that's like true across the board I think with, with my immigration lawyer colleagues so we created um, an advocacy I created a coalition with some some colleagues and um, the coalition for international entrepreneurship um, and it was a group of stakeholders immigration attorneys people um, from the National Venture Capital Association just lots of people involved in startups um, and we submitted an open letter to the Department of Homeland Security to the secretary asking for, you know, some modifications to the program, like processing times, things like that. And um, we submitted that, I think it was in early 2022. And we didn't get any feedback. And again, processing times were just slow, 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 slow. We've had meetings with the White House. And now some good news is that they've created a section in the policy manual on this option and um, they have kind of given you know stated that they are aware about the processing times issue and that they are making a conscious effort to get those processing times manageable and um, so I am confident that this option could be feasible for people in a shorter period much shorter period of time than we've seen before we don't know exactly how long we're waiting for specific processing times to be published and unfortunately, this option cannot be premium processed, like expedited processing that you can have for other options. Um, however, I still think for some people, this could be a good option. Um, you know, for some people, it might be your only option. If you just maybe, there may be, uh, uh, there's definitely situations where this is just your only option right now. And if it takes a few months, four or five months, however long it will take, it's still your best only option. Um, other people might have a, you know, few options, but they have time on their side and they can wait for this option to to be like completed. So I think it's definitely an individualized case by case assessment. But I just want to say that I've never been more excited to, you know, be recommending this option. In the past, I did feel like it was a hard thing to recommend given the processing times. But that's changed now, given the, you know, the really the action that we have seen from the USCIS and their commitment uh, that they've given us to to, you know, wanting to see these cases adjudicated and see this option utilized. So I know I'm not alone when I say how excited we are for this option. And also, I just want to say that advocacy works. You know, sometimes people well, you know, I've written extensively and spoken extensively on this and on the need for a startup visa. And sometimes it feels like you, you can be just shouting into the void, but then we see action. You know, yes, we haven't seen a startup visa from Congress, but we've seen some other options like this. And we've seen, you know, our feedback be taken into account. And yes, it wasn't necessarily immediately taken into account, but we nonetheless, it was. And so that's encouraging. Um. Let me pop to questions. And um, before I do that, though, I'm just going to give you some of our handles. Liz from our marketing team is did all these. And these are all different types of like social platforms for the firm. I am um, at US Visa Lawyer on a lot of our social media. And um, I have some other handle on um, TikTok. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to go to the questions. Okay, so somebody's saying, okay, question coming in. Thank you for asking these. Um, okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll answer this second question last. So someone la, or now, and um, someone's asking how long the processing times are. So this has not been published. The processing times in the past it was long. Just anecdotally, from what we'd seen, it was like maybe twelve months long. Um, now we're hearing that there's a commitment to get them much, much shorter. So I don't know exactly, but I would say if we filed a case and didn't hear anything after three or four months, I would I would work to try to place inquiries. We cannot guarantee processing times, though. 
Um, and that's why you really need an individualized analysis to know whether this option is going to work for you because the processing times are uncertain. So thank you for asking that question. Um, okay, so someone's asking, does someone on the parole need to be in the US for a specific number of days of the year or can they have some flexibility on the amount of time that they spend? Um, thanking for the for the info. You're welcome for the information. Um, I don't think there's any restrictions on how long you need to spend in the US. I know that there is a... Um, cap of like you know if the initial parole is for a two and a half year period max um and then the potential to extend it but i mean these are you are companies that are receiving funding from u.s based sources so presumably just from a practical point of view there are there would be expectations from the vcs that you know people are going to be at least in the US for a portion of the time but I don't think from I can't think of anything offhand that requires people to be in the US for any set number of time to- of you know days um not that I've seen it's not to say it, it, it doesn't exist but I haven't come across it and I also think it's just most people want to be here for as long as possible um with obviously the option to to you'd be able to travel um, but I don't know that there's any specific restrictions on how long you need to be in the US. Um, okay, so someone's saying, could parole be used if the company has just been founded? Okay, so I would say that like incorporation date is not necessarily um, determinative, but what's important is that you're meeting the requirements for the parole program. So have you raised the funds that you need in order to qualify um you know do we have some more evidence of this potential for rapid growth and job creation um you know these are things that we need to assess I do think sometimes it takes a little bit of time for people to get that initial investment um but I think that there's no reason why we couldn't file it shortly after the company had been founded assuming we're meeting the requirements um the reason I think this is the great option for some people, and maybe the only option that I mentioned, um, some people might not be at the O1 extraordinary ability visa level yet. Now, the O1 is an option that we do for startup founders all the time. I'm going to be doing another future webinar on that option. I did one for the O1B, which is the creative, um, you know, creative um arts and entertainment 01 and then the 01a is more for the business side so I'll be doing that a, a webinar so please join our mailing list if you want to hear about that should be coming up in, in the next month or two um but some people aren't at the 01 level yet an example would be let's say you know you this is a real example let's say you were a model and um you have tons of like 01 maybe modeling expertise but you want to get into you have this like health startup or something that's like a startup that's really not necessarily directly to your related to your prior experience. So in that scenario, you may be 01 in the modeling, but you may not be 01 as like a as a as a startup um founder. So for you, it's your first startup. You don't have all the evidence that would would enable you to qualify for this extraordinary ability visa. Um, but you could if you have the funding and if you you know checking the boxes for parole it could be that could be a great option for you um so i don't think that the age of the company should be a barrier to people qualifying for this assuming they meet the requirements um okay so somebody is asking what is the difference between a visa and a parole so the visa a visa is a status that was they all the visa options have been created by Congress in the law. Um, the parole uses the existing parole authority in in a, in an existing law. So it's a new use of like a parole authority. Um, the kind of main difference from a practical point of view is you can't change status to parole in the US. So let's say you're on an F1 student visa. For this parole process, you're applying for the application then you're getting either advanced parole or a boarding document. And then you're coming, you're leaving and you're coming back into the US and you're paroled on entry. 
that's kind of how this works. If you, on the other hand, were in F1 status as a student and wanted to change status to a H1B visa or to an O1 visa, you can file a change of status in the US and on approval, assuming you were in status and this is how the case was filed, you can automatically change into your new visa status um, on, on approval of that. So that's kind of the practical differences. Um, it's It's mainly because it wasn't a law that was passed by Congress and it's u- utilizing the existing parole authority. And so you can't really change status to or from it. Um, but I think it's a minor difference. And I think that the benefits of this, um, I mean, obviously we need a startup visa. Um, and so, you know, so we definitely n- need to have that. Um, so somebody is asking about costs. I mean, that would be something that we would discuss on an individual basis. There are attorney fees and government filing fees. um, But we would talk to you if we did a consultation with you about those fees. Um, So, okay, so I've done that answer. Okay, someone's asking about the international entrepreneur. Can you travel internationally and come back in? I mean, I think in theory, you should be able to be use your parole document to come in and out. Um, it would depend on though, this is a newer option. So we're not really seeing how this is playing out in practice. But I mean, I think the expectation was that this could be a multiple entry in and out type documentation and that people could use this within the two and a half year period. Um, I will say that because it is a newer option, um, we don't have a lot of history of how this option is working. Um, so I think there are some kind of unknowns that we still need to see, but I think that that was certainly the expectation was that people would be able to travel and come in on the International Entrepreneur Pro. Um, well, I think that concludes all our questions. Um, I hope people find it beneficial. Uh, it's a an exciting option that I think is only going to get more feasible for people. Um, If you're raising funds, have raised funds in the US and, um, you know, that's kind of the starting point is like if if your company, and this is why I said it's not specific to startups. However, most people who are getting money and raising money from VCs, you know, it is that startup type business model that has potential to, you know, grow the return for the investor as well. Um, But we're excited about it. I hope everybody has um, seen my book, which is US Immigration Options for Startups, Accelerate Your American Dream. It's an ebook. It's on Amazon. Um, Liz from our marketing, our marketing manager can send you through a link to the Amazon book. Um, I would love some feedback if you do have a chance to read it. Um, It was you know, a a lot of work to put everything together. And I just wanted to put you know, all these resources in one place for people to access. And I felt like it would be beneficial to founders and getting some great feedback. So hopefully you feel the same way. Um, Thanks for joining us today. If you want to get in touch, um, you can email our firm, info at mackintylaw.com. Find us online. Um, I think, you know, from here, we would probably recommend individual consultations with people so we can assess um, this option. Again, there may be other options that would work for you, but that would enable us to kind of take time to go over those. Um, But I appreciate the participation and um, thank you all for joining us. And I'm going to wrap up and I will see you again soon. Thank you very much. Take care.